Eberfurst. Chronicles of Everfall, Shadow of the Conqueror, a novel by... Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome back to Medieval Misconceptions. Now, in this episode, I want to address uh, a kind of, t you know, topic that somewhat understood, yet de deserves more attention and more detail. It's the idea of the internal light of the medieval period, okay? How do they get light uh, when it's dark and outside in the medieval period? And address some of the big misconceptions about torches, okay? And this, of course, is not only good to understand from a historical perspective, but it's also good to understand if you're adapting it into medieval settings in fantasy for role-playing games, literature, books, and other things like that. Even in artwork, because that's actually kind of a big thing as well, because when um, uh, people try and depict medieval period, like the interiors of castles and stuff like that, and it's nighttime. Well, one of the go-to defaults that seems to be around, and it's just in general medieval everything, and this is in historical adaptations and fantasy, that they just use torches, okay? And a torch is like a bit of wood with flame on the end, stuck on all the walls. Now, I've already kind of lightly addressed this in many other videos saying, uh, no, no, okay, too many torches on the inside, they use candles. Well, I'm gonna do a bit of a deep dive and actually break apart some of the mechanics as to why it's so impractical to use torches inside, what they did use, and not only inside, but also outside, okay? If you're going outside, what type of lighting would you use? Because Torches were used. That's, that's, uh, you know, we hope that we don't swing too far in the opposite direction when we're trying to correct misconceptions. Because when I say candles were used inside, that is not to say that torches weren't used at all. Okay. The torch is a practical lighting implement in certain specific circumstances. And I'm going to try and share what they are. So the only way people could get light in the medieval period when it was dark is with fire. So all these lighting methods that we'll be talking about in this video is applications of fire, essentially. And of course, the most basic one being a torch, just a stick that's on fire on the end, all right? The problem if you just use a stick by itself is it'll go out pretty quickly. So they generally needed to wrap the end in some type of linen or cloth. And that linen was soaked in either fat, oil, and sometimes even more creative mixtures between water, lime, and sulfur, okay? So something that would burn quicker. So there was a couple of different fuels that they were able to use. And this, of course, extends the burn time of a torch considerably than if it was just fire. But these are all kind of elaborate applications. There are other ways that you can make a basic torch quite effectively. Bundle up a whole heap of sticks. Doesn't need to be sticks. It'll be dried grass, reeds, or rushes. All bundled together, they'll burn pretty regularly. One of the things that all these torches have in common, though, is is that they won't burn for ages, okay? We're looking at maybe 10 minutes. I, I, it's gonna range always between 10 minutes and at the most like half an hour, an hour if you, there's a lot of fuel and everything. But think about this, okay? If uh, the medieval person is gonna stay up for how many hours after the sun sets? And, you know, if I we compare it to nowadays, we could expect maybe four hours. And I know modern, you know, sleeping habits are very different to the medieval period. They would have woken when the sun rise. And the idea that they go to sleep when the sun sets, so, no, okay, medieval people, they're the same as us, all right? Same biological beings, and we can expect that they would be able to survive on the same length of sleep as we do. So that can be between six and eight hours on average. That means there's a decent portion of their waking time that will be spent when the sun is not out. And so you're going to need a lighting source that will be able to sustain itself for up to four hours or more. And a torch is a fairly big thing that consumes a fairly large amount of material. And so that's the first impracticality of using torches. Not to say that they weren't used. I will get to the point, the applications where they were used and where they come in more effectively. But a bigger problem with torches on the inside is the fact that they're burning a lot of material. What happens to that material? Now, of course, a lot of it is converted into carbon dioxide, you know, smoke in the air, but then you've got all the ashes and flakes and stuff that drop onto the ground. So the idea that you have a torch and you put it in a sconce on a wall to just burn to give lighting on the inside means it'll create a horrible mess on the floor, and it's also a huge fire hazard. The flame on the end of these torches can get pretty high, and if they start to lick against the wall or even reach the roof, and if there are hot ashes or embers flicking away from the torch that falls on the ground, you could set your whole house on fire. And you might be thinking, well, if it's in a stone castle, it's not really going to be set on fire. There's a lot of 
you know, timber elements inside stone, particularly the roof and the floor. And even if it won't set things on fire, which it's always a risk, you got this horrible mess on the ground that you're gonna have to clean up every single day. This is a horribly impractical lighting implement for inside. So what did they use to light the inside of their homes, both castles and cottages, or of course, candles. Now candles can be a little bit misunderstood because I've had some people say that they're horribly expensive in the medieval period and some people say no and of course well, the answer is the candle is not just one single thing. I mean, not all candles are expensive. You have expensive candles and you have cheap candles, all right? One of the most common types of candles used in the medieval period was something called a rush light. I prefer to call them rush candles because that's exactly what they are. You get the dried kind of stem of a rush, all right? And they get soaked in either fat or oil, okay, which is plentiful. And you can get fat very easily if you got any type of animal that you're butchering, all right? If you get all the, you know, the fatty bits, and even the skin, though, you'd want to probably tan the skin into some type of usable leather, but that you have to scrape off a lot of material on the inside of the skin, this kind of fatty membrane there, and even the bones and stuff, and you put it into a pot and just boil it. The fat will rise to the surface, okay? And then you just scoop out the fat and you have the fat, and it'll be kind of a mixture of other, you know, bits of junk in there as well. It'll be a bit of a mess, but anyway, mostly fat, all right? And then what you do, you get this rush, you soak it in all this fat, and uh, any, the, the, the even the poorest peasant is able to do this. They soak it, and you can get like a huge amount of rushes, soak them all, all right? And then when they dry, you have what's called a rush light. You usually rest them on some type of thing. They even, like, specific permanent iron fixtures were made to hold rush light specifically, all right? And they, you, you set them alight. Now, the quality of rush lights can actually vary. Some can burn up to a full hour, which is, and so for how cheap and small it is, and to get a steady, consistent light, pretty good. And in actual fact, there's accounts saying that rush lights sometimes provided better light than certain tallow candles that you could buy. So these were really effective, really cheap. Now, some would only last for like, say, 10 minutes if something was weird and just burnt through the oil or fat really quickly, something like that. So there was variance, but as soon as it burnt out, you just replace it. It's that easy. And if you're wondering how these, you know, rush lights were lit and how they just produce fire in the medieval period, basic flint and steel, okay? A fire striker. And so there are different types that existed for many years and they have kind of a flat-ish surface. That's the surface you're striking against the flint. It could also be quartz to produce you know, sparks and you use that to light small, you know, tinder that can catch a light easily. Then you have a full fire and, that, and then you'll probably light these uh, rush candles on the fire good to go. And then once you have one candle, you can light the next and that's not a problem. Now, rush candles were used for a very long time. There's even a, a story focused around the rush light in Aesop's Fables. And the exact date of the origin of Aesop's Fables is hard to, you know, pin down. It's generally around 500 BC or something. But anyway, rush candles been around for ages. And if you're looking for the standard, most commonly used lighting source in the medieval period, even before then, all right, Rush candles are gonna be the most prominent one. Next one, normal candles, of course, in whatever type of chandeliers, wall-mounted sconces would hold these candles as well. Handheld candelabras and all that, okay? Candles, and of course, lanterns. Lanterns that either have a candle inside or are fueled by an oiled wick. And by the way, oil lamps as well. All good effective methods for lighting on the inside that last a long while. So this is the lighting source of the inside of homes covered fairly comprehensively, but what about outside, okay? Because a small rush candle isn't going to be nearly as effective outside as inside. One of the big problems is wind. It doesn't take much of a breeze to blow that thing out. Now there are ways that you can protect it and we'll get there because this is when the shielded lantern of course comes in. But the other problem about using say something like a rush light is the amount of light they produce. It can generally be enough, okay? Because uh, flames of that size were used inside lanterns, okay? And in terms of the types of medieval lanterns that you will find. Glass did exist in the medieval period, but the quality was very different, okay? It wasn't completely smooth or completely clear. It definitely would have been adequate enough to make some of the facings on certain lanterns, but you didn't need to use glass to protect, you know, this small little flame from the wind. There are also full metal encasings that have holes punched all the way through. Check out this picture here that will let the light through and also protect the flame on the inside. And the flame can be produced by a candle, and so maybe a rush light candle, but generally you need something that's uh, easier to put inside. So a more traditional candle would be what I would say was used more predominantly. And of course, something like an oiled wick. But could everyone afford a lantern like this? 
No, they were poor people as well. What would the poor person who doesn't have access to Atlanta news? And this is where we come back to torches. Torches are a very effective outside lighting implement, all right? Uh, because of the size of the flame, you generally don't need to worry too much about them getting blown out. I'm sure it could happen in some instances in strong wind, but in most cases, they would serve adequately enough. One of the things we need to take into account is the length of the burn, because torches, they, uh, I, I've, you know, heard people who have tested this, and they generally say anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes. These are not long-term lighting implements that will last hours. But actually, these are generally only on tests done on the traditional cliché handheld torch. This is where uh, a lot of people actually don't, um, they miss something, okay? Because uh, clearly, all right, if you need a larger source of light outside, and a torch is one of the best options you can pick, because generally a torch will produce more light than a lantern, what would they do if it's not burning long enough? They would make it in a way to burn longer. Actual medieval torches that were meant to be used over a longer period of time looked somewhat different to the cliché kind of medieval torch that people show around. And I know you don't hold it in front of your face, you just hold it up or to the side, okay? You don't really need to hold it behind you. Just up, perfectly fine, that'll do the job. You don't light by yourself. But anyway, okay, torches meant to be used for a longer period of time. Check out these references here. Look at the length of these torches. And what's interesting about these, you know, medieval torches, okay, they're divided. You see a much meatier head with a stick that's actually held underneath. These are almost like staffs. And what these really look like is all this meat up here is actually material that the torch can burn down upon for a much longer burn period. Because medieval people weren't stupid. If the torch isn't lasting long enough, the conclusion isn't to say, well, they never use torches outside, which I have heard some people say that the medieval torches is a misconception they don't use. No, no, no. They made a torch that actually did the job that they needed. Now, were all medieval torches like this? No, of course, there would be smaller ones, larger ones, whatever suited the purpose or intent that they were needed for. There is another element that needs to be considered when we're looking at the flame torch, and it's related to its own inconvenience. It actually leads to something that creates a, a larger misconception, and it's kind of the one that we started in the beginning of this video, the idea of torches sitting in sconces, lining walls, lighting up castles inside and outside. Side. And it's the fact that torches are very inconvenient when you need to put them down, all right? They're very difficult for to rest on the ground. Now, for the longer, really large ones, you can just drive them into the ground, or if there's just a hole pre-made that you can just slip it into in the ground, they'll stand free, not a problem. But if they're small, hand, you could kind of do that, but then they're low, the flame is, you know, where you might run into it, just impracticalities and stuff. And so this is where, of course, the sconce comes in. The sconce, as far as I've been out of research, was never intended as a permanent lighting fixture, but a convenient tool to place the torch when you needed to put it down. Now, it could be used to light the outside of certain buildings where you have a torch on a sconce. It doesn't matter that, you know, junk is falling on the ground and there's nothing for the open flame to set a light. All right, so that could provide a measure of light for the outside, but smaller torches like this, they don't last very long, as we've already mentioned, and larger torches, well, they're, they're really long. They won't fit in a sconce. They're too high, and so so you just stick them all down. I suppose you could have really long ones sticking out of a wall. But... So if you're using a torch regularly, if you're, it's late at night and you need to go outside to get some more firewood to do some whatever thing, you hear a noise and you want to go outside and check what's going on, and you needed more light than what is produced by a lantern, a torch is one of the better options you can pick, and you're not going outside very long. So again, torch, perfectly adequate. And you're going outside, you might have an unlit torch in a sconce next to the outside of your home or door, ready to just grab Go inside, you set a light, or you have a candle that you set a light there, put the candle down, and you got your torch, you hold it around, you do your job, and when you're coming back, you might need it for a bit later if you're going out again or not, but it might just make sense to put it out, chuck it back in the sconce, ready to be used again. An outside torch should be lit, turned on and off, as you need. And so perhaps the idea of the torch sitting in a sconce on a wall for long periods of time was actually a practical functional thing where it was there ready to be used, but it wasn't intended to be lit in the sconce to provide light for long periods of time. If you want light on the outside of your home or building for a longer period of time, you'd, it'd be much better to hang a lantern, all right? Some type of oil lamp on the inside that would burn for longer, providing regular light for whoever's going outside. Now, there are some instances where torches were used 
least inside, so I don't want to, you know, have the pendulum swing too far in the opposite direction. For instance, during feasts, where they wanted more lighting, these longer burning torches look to have been brought into the feast to provide more light uh, for the party goers and stuff like that. We have the references right here. But it certainly seems far more so that torches were used outside as a source of light than inside because of those problems that I've previously mentioned. So now let's take all the things that we've talked about and try and apply it a bit to the fantasy setting, because you have this classic idea of the adventurer, you know, searching out ruins or a dungeon, holding a torch above his head, and especially in like video games, torches, they just seem to last forever. Well, of course, torches like this could be a perfectly adequate tool depending on the length of the journey or the exploration of the dungeon or ruins or whatever. If it's going to be a several hours long endeavor, carrying all these torches with you, like one torch burns out, you light another one, it burns out, and, and you'd have it to have heaps with you to cover the length of time you need, completely impractical, all right? A far more practical solution would, of course, be a lantern. That, or a torch that is made to burn for a much longer period of time, like the torches we see in medieval artwork. Something much longer. So it's interesting, the classic fantasy torch of the adventurer holding through the, you know, ruins and dungeons, stuff like that, should look completely different. The smaller ones, impractical. They don't really work well. And if they want more light than just a small lantern can produce, something big, like that. Here we go. And this brings us to the end of this video on medieval lighting. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.